Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor. And today I'm so excited because we have a very special guest today. This is Jessica Jordan, and she's going to be an amazing guest. She's going to talk about sexual addiction and she's going to hit different topics and things that we really need to start talking about that some of the things might be a little taboo, but you know, it's really, it goes on in society every day. And these are things that we need to talk about. And she's going to talk about holistic ways to overcome a lot of these issues. Before we begin though, I'm just going to give a quick shout out to dmaworld.com. dmaworld.com is a marketing consultant agency who helps little businesses grow to big businesses. They don't want you to get ripped off by those big companies that are very expensive. So check out Mark. He's the owner at dmaworld.com. And he wants to help you grow into one of those big companies and not have to pay a fortune. So Jessica, I'm so excited to have you on the show. This has been amazing. I had a little discussion with you beforehand and you have such great information to share. Why don't you tell everybody to begin a little about yourself and what you do? Yeah. So I am a former wildlife biologist who used to run around in the forest collecting scientific data, <laughs> finding owls <laughs> <in the red laughs> uh, to help prevent species extinction. Yeah. And at some point, uh, well, February 21st, 2016, <laughs> <laughs> I was on a rock climbing trip with some friends and I had ingested um, the wrong batch of smoked canned oysters that had a naturally occurring seafood neurotoxin that sent me on a five-year recovery journey. Wow. It put a 19 millimeter lesion in the left front lobe of my brain. Wow. It uh, gave me many dozens of near-death experiences where it almost stopped my heart. Uh, cardiac arrest almost happened many times. Um, respiratory paralysis, things like that, spiraled me into PTSD. And something that's very common when someone has head trauma is the brain and the subconscious mind creates something called hypersexuality disorder. Wow. where the body has these hyper extreme sexual urges. And during that time, you know, it's essentially like a sex addiction yeah. that the body is experiencing without even having made prior decisions regarding anything sexual related. Right. And so for me, it kind of spiraled me into more of like a sex addiction. And during the time of my, uh, my recovery period, I was dating a man on and off for three years who was severely addicted to pornography. Right. This is how I learned that porn addiction was even a thing. I had no yeah. idea. And now I've devoted my entire life to helping men overcome pornography or other sex related addictions. Yeah. And it is absolutely incredible. Healing from trauma is a gift. Uh, I personally feel like getting brain damage and all of this stuff, this PTSD, this hypersexuality disorder. It's like the greatest gift that has been handed to me by the universe on a silver yeah. platter <laughs> mm -hmm. because I needed a massive wake up call to, for me to truly know who I am, for right. me to step into a larger purpose to me, for me to heal from childhood trauma that I had no idea was even there. Yeah. I didn't know it existed. Just like most people who have most adults who have unresolved childhood trauma are unaware of it, just like I was unaware right. of it. And as I was doing my healing journey and learning of, I was very obvious I had PTSD, like extremely obvious. Yeah. <laughs> extremely obvious. <laughs> and I, I was reading an amazing book that maybe you and your listeners have heard of before. It's called The Body Keeps the Score. And it's an incredible book to learn about trauma. And I almost skipped across the section of the book around childhood trauma. I'm like, that doesn't pertain to me. Right. I have this adult trauma from brain damage and this ingesting this neurotoxin. And during, I just decided to read it. Yeah. And that was actually one of the most pivotal, life-changing, terrifying moments of my life because I realized that I had childhood trauma that had gone unresolved when I was learning what it really was. And it, in that moment, I felt totally broken, totally isolated, totally just like something in, on the planet that nobody else could understand and felt forever unfixable. Yeah. And it was terrifying because at this time when that happened, I had no idea 
that anyone can heal from trauma. And I had no idea how many people have trauma. Yeah. So many people, so many people have trauma. And I mean, I was one of those like extreme charismatic extroverts who would go around and like have a good time and you would just wouldn't know. Yeah. But a lot of that behavior was also around uh, external validation seeking. Mm-hmm. I identify as being an external validation seeking addict. Right. <laughs> so, um, so my recovery journey, journey was deeply healing, deeply uh, humbling, uh, going into that dark night of the soul and really discovering these parts of who I was that I didn't want to look at because they were not right. fun, they were scary, they were terrifying. Uh, and then it just, all right, let's learn and heal and uh, learn the strategies that I, I need to, to, to heal yeah. from this stuff. Right. And, you know, in all of my research around healing from PTSD and healing from my uh, ciguatera neurotoxin illness, when doctors and all sorts of doctors were giving me like no help, no advice. So I took a super deep dive into the scientific literature right. on neurobiology and neuroscience and the nervous system and the brain and psychology. And I, created my own healing protocol, which healed me from all of it, everything. And when I was doing my research on all of this stuff, a lot of addiction stuff would come up. And at the Mm -hmm. time I was like, well, that's just an annoying, pesky thing. That's not what I'm here to research. Yeah. Eventually I realized like, oh my goodness, like the way that anyone can heal from, uh, for a, from trauma PTSD, you apply those same strategies for any addiction. Right. And the same, the same changes in the mind and the brain and the subconscious mind need to take place, whether it's addiction or Mm -hmm. trauma. And really what I came to learn is any addiction is merely a symptom of unresolved trauma. Right. So addiction recovery at its core is trauma healing, trauma recovery, healing those old emotional wounds of the past. Yeah. Because one of the biggest lies that we've been told is that, what is it like a uh, time heals all wounds or whatever. And that is yeah. such a lie. <laughs> it time is. festers all wounds. Yes. Time festers all wounds. And as it's festering, the way that it shows up is, you know, anxiety or depression or emotional numbness or tuning out or ADHD, all of these different things. And so it's really healing those emotional wounds of the past. That is an absolute requirement. Right. And I needed to heal those emotional wounds of my past to overcome my physical illness, because the physical body will only heal when you activate uh, the parasympathetic nervous system, which is where you feel safe and loved and secure. Yeah. elevated oxytocin and serotonin, you know, there's a, a set of neurochemical conditions that are required for the, for physical chronic illness healing. Yeah. So that's where I was doing all my, uh, putting basically all my effort. And then I realized that I had accidentally healed an addiction. I wasn't aware of. Yeah. <laughs> I realized it afterwards. And, um, you know, one day I was doing a self-compassion meditation Mm -hmm. And in that meditation, I felt so full and whole and complete Yeah, that there was only one thing in the world that I wanted. And it was for everyone, no matter who you are, no matter what your story or history or past is, I wanted everyone to feel as good as I did in that moment. Yeah, It was absolutely incredible. And so my subconscious mind presented a question to me. I said, who needs this the most? And instantly my subconscious mind provided an answer and it was men suffering from pornography addiction. Right. I was like, they don't know where to turn or they have all of these places to turn, but it kind of leads them to a dead end where it's not actually the true deep healing that is required for them to, to really make it happen for themselves. And in that moment, I had this big aha moment. I was like, oh my goodness, I actually know exactly. I have the solution. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and from that moment forward, I have never looked back. Right. And that is how my Leap of Courage program got created. And that was oh, about four and a half years now or so. Right. 
it's been growing ever since. And now I work with adult men to overcome pornography or any sex related addiction. But since addiction usually doesn't come in, uh, you know, a single package, there's normally multiple addict addictive behaviors or substances with it. Yeah. So someone will come to me to overcome, you know, say pornography addiction, but then I help them identify every single one of their addictive behaviors or escapism behaviors. Right. And essentially then we tackle it holistically because if it's not tackled holistically, what ultimately happens is someone will switch from one addiction to the next. Yes. And I call it playing addiction whack-a-mole. Or <laughs> oh, pop that one down and then another pops up. Oh, pop that down. Oh, and then it's no one, you can't heal that way. Right. And it has to be holistic in order for it to matter and make a difference. And so in a nutshell, in a long nutshell, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's what I do. Now, how does someone who just, you know, occasionally looks at porn and someone, you know, who's consistently looking at porn, what's the difference between someone who just does it every once in a while? And what's the difference between an addict? You know, I, you know, is, is it someone who just likes to look at it once in a while? And then how do you know when you're actually addicted to it, when it, when it is it, it overbearing your life? Like, how do you know you're addicted to porn or any type of, you know, addiction that you've been familiarized with? Yeah. So essentially, if you're unsure, if anyone is unsure, if they're addicted to something, then the best way is to put it to the test and say, okay, I am going to not engage in that activity for the next 30 days. Right. See if you're able to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Simply putting it to the test is the easiest way to know. Right. And everyone, addiction is on a spectrum of intensity. Right. Yeah. And so for some people, they might be able to go 30 days very easily. Yeah. And for some people, they might be able to go the 30 days, but it might feel like absolute torture. They might have extreme insomnia. They might uh, have be more emotionally sensitive. Yeah. Uh, they might be now reaching towards other high dopamine escapism activities. They might notice right. themselves eating more junk food, watching more Netflix, scrolling more social media, um, binging on YouTube. Um, binging on YouTube is a big one for my clients and they- Oh, are, really? Oh, yeah. Um, and so, or, you know, whatever it might be, smoking more weed to numb out the emotions. And so it's addiction- is not a pursuit of the pleasure. Right. Addiction is really an escaping from the pain. Yeah. Escaping, yeah, escaping from some stress for sure that exists in your neurology because stress is not what happens out in the world. That's a stressor. Yeah. A stress is their internal reaction on a neurochemical level. Mm -hmm. And the thoughts that come along with it, the emotions, right? And so yeah. It's when the number one trigger for a relapse to any addiction is a stress response in the body. Right. And sure. oftentimes, uh, every time that someone chooses the escapism from yeah. the stress response, yeah, they're every time that happens, they're weakening their neurology yeah. to be able to handle stress. And what this means is that through time, smaller and smaller stressors will be a trigger to go engage in some escapism behavior. And right. every escapism behavior is a slippery slope that can turn into an addiction. Yeah. And it's essentially running away and rather than problem solving. Right. With whatever caused the stress. And so the, does that answer your question about the addiction, if it's an addiction or not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But now what happens if someone realizes they're addicted to something? What's the next step? If they want to get help, what's the next step? Yeah. So that's a really great question because I first want to address that usually the moment that someone has the self-awareness that they're addicted is usually not the same moment that they want to fix or solve the problem. Okay. It can be sometimes years. Mm -hmm. or even decades right? before someone has the bravery to commit to themselves to say that 
I'm going to stop this behavior. I'm going to stop this substance. I no longer want to be a person who this is part of my identity. I right. want, I don't want this anymore. And so that right there is massive. Yeah. Uh, it takes a, a, a tremendous amount of bravery. And here's why. That addictive substance or behavior is serving as the nickname is the adult security blanket. Actually, pornography in particular yeah. has been uh, coined as the adult security blanket. Right. But it can really be applied to any escapism behavior and therefore any addictive substance or behavior. And ultimately, the subconscious mind says, I feel insecure in some way. The moment we get a twinge of discomfort, that's a stress response. That's the yeah. subconscious mind going, oh, I, I don't know about this. Whoa, this doesn't feel good. Let's escape right now. What can we do? Yeah. What can we do? Uh, right. You know, like, let me go grab that vape. Let me go watch that porn. Let me go scroll social media. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And almost always this is happening on a subconscious level where we don't have conscious rational awareness. Yeah. These are automatic, uh, like, patterns, subconscious programmed patterns that have developed and strengthened. Right time that we do it without thinking almost every time we grab our phone <laughs> it's like some subconscious like yeah oh, I, I have three seconds of I don't know what I'm doing right now grab the phone yeah exactly <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and that's ultimately saying I'm really uncomfortable with myself I need a distraction from myself the moment I'm left with my thoughts and feelings to myself it's really uncomfortable let me escape right so and really I'll go ahead I'm sorry so I totally didn't answer your question at all. That was like a prelude. To no, I think that's a great answer. And, and so it seems like people actually go through a denial stage before they actually do something about it. And sometimes it seems like that denial stage could last a very long time for some. Yeah. Well, and even after they're past the denial stage and they're in the awareness. Yeah. Then the reason why taking action is very scary is because to the subconscious mind, the safest and most valuable thing in their life is that addictive substance or behavior. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's saying, I'm going to get rid of the thing that keeps me the most safe. Right. Like a security blanket, like a pillow that you like, you know, that you feel safe with. Exactly. And so it's all about reteaching the subconscious mind how to feel safe in the absence of an addictive behavior or substance. And at first it's the conscious rational mind has to say, yes, mm -hmm. I know this is possible. Yeah. And then the courage of the subconscious mind has to say, Ooh, I don't like this, but I'm going to go for it. This feels like the worst decision. Yeah. No, I have to do it. And it's, <laughs> there's this battle between the conscious rational mind and the subconscious feeling mind. And the physical body is like a grand extension of the subconscious mind. That's why we, you know, a lot of uh, withdrawal symptoms are in the physical body. Yeah. And so, wow. yeah. So when, when they, when they go into take their first step, like if someone came to you and say, okay, I'm aware I have this addiction. I want to change. Now what, what do I do? What would you, what would you say to them? Like, what would be your advice, your comfort in to them? Yeah. And are you asking specifically if someone's coming to me about, you know, a, a porn or sex related addiction or anyone out there in the world? Anyone out there in the world who's listening to this that knows they have either a sex addiction or a porn addiction and they it's interfering with their life, let's say, you know, they have a spouse, they have a partner, you know, they're sick of seeing them on, on, on the internet watching porn. They're sick of them of either, you know, bothering them for sex and it's getting to the point where it's, it's, it's beyond pleasurable anymore you know, and, and, and they see that it's become a problem and now they want to, they, they, they know something's wrong. They're not exactly sure the root cause maybe, but they're, they want to get help. And so, you know, now what, you know, what's the first step? What's the, what do they start doing? That's going to help them. Like if you had to offer like some suggestions of tech, you know, tools and techniques, you know, to get them on the right pathway to healing, what would be some of your suggestions? Yeah. Well, first I would um, honor their bravery. I would communicate that back to them. That's what I would <laughs> say back first. And yeah, foremost. no, it's for a, sure. It's a, it's a true act of courage. Yeah. It really is. 
Um, and then having a conversation about, okay, uh, you don't want to go this the solo route. It's a really, really, really good idea to ask for help yeah. for, in, in multiple capacities. One, finding a community of mm -hmm. people who are addicted to the same thing that you are and you can feel not alone, you feel less isolated, you feel seen, you feel understood and you're you're being seen in a way that you're not rejected because on the subconscious level, uh, one of the strongest emotions that addicts experience is shame and low self-worth yes. and fear of rejection, fears of inadequacy, especially a sex-related addiction because of the cultural taboos associated with it. So there tends to be a much stronger uh, shame component yeah. associated with it. And it is impossible to heal and recover from addiction and trauma when living by the neurochemicals of shame. It's impossible. It just won't right. happen. It right. will not happen. <laughs> yeah. And so it's finding that community where you can speak so openly you know, the number of times I've had my clients say like, hey, I've had a therapist for five years and I was never able to even bring up the topic of my porn addiction because the shame wouldn't let me. Yeah, I believe it. I, I've, you know, it, it's very hard sometimes to find a good coach or a good therapist because you have to have that connection. But I, I like when you talk about being in a, in a group because you have a bunch of people who are going through the same thing. You might have different stories, but you're all going through the same emotions. You're all mm -hmm. going through, you know, similar, you know, you have the similar symptoms, you have the similar emotions and hearing other people talk, you, you no longer feel like you're alone. You know, right. and then you listen to other people and other people's ways of coping with it. And then you have someone there gearing the conversation, giving guidance, and then putting ideas, you know, slowly into the conversation where it starts the healing process. So I think that's yeah. amazing what you do. Thank you. Well, and I want to add something really important about groups because it is a double edged sword mm -hmm. and a lot of groups will actually, if it's not done the right way, right will keep a person stuck without moving forward. And so it might be maybe five or 10% of the importance. Is, uh -huh. But it, it's, you know, the percentage is a little bit, you know, you can't really put a number on it. Yeah, yeah. The reason why I say this is because, so one part that's really important, and I think we can all easily agree on this, yeah. is well, one thing that is very healing to the subconscious mind is revealing the deepest, darkest parts of who you are and in that moment, mm -hmm. you are accepted and understood and you're met with kindness and compassion yes. and empathy. That mm -hmm. right there is so deeply healing, necessary and mandatory Oh, for sure. to heal from addiction and trauma. It is yeah. so important. However, there is a ton of groups that get stuck there. Yeah. They have the connection piece. Yeah. They say, I see you, you see me. I feel your pain because I'm living it too. Yeah. And they have that connection, but they get stuck there. And yeah. oftentimes they'll just keep showing up and sharing the same hardship stories, hardship stories, hardship stories. And they're reinforcing that into their neurology that this is hard. Let me tell you this, the new story that I have. Or yeah. let me retell those new people in the group. Let me retell my story for the hundredth time. Yeah. That is so deeply damaging. Mm -hmm. And it's where someone gets stuck. Yeah. But the reason why it, uh, on a surface level, it's also on a subconscious level, but why it feels so good is because you're getting validation every yeah. time you tell your story and by people who understand it. And it is so validating yeah. in every human being on the planet loves to be validated. Oh yeah, for sure. And Tim Ferriss has talked about this. If you're familiar with Tim Ferriss at all. Yeah. About, mm -hmm. and, I, and I once lived the dangers of this myself where there's people out there who will, they'll literally get a dopamine high and an ego boost yeah. off of telling their victim story. Mm -hmm. And because what they are ex receiving back every time, you know, is that, they learn how to tell it and who to tell it to. And they're getting that kindness, compassion, and empathy. And that's the only time and place in their life 
in this world where they know how to achieve a momentarily uh, feeling of safety is let me tell my victim story to someone who's compassionate. Yeah. And then I get the, you're so strong. I'm so inspired by you. Keep going. And they're living that then becomes the adult security blanket, another yeah. one of the adult security blankets. And literally the retelling of the victim story becomes highly addictive. Yeah. I, I fell into that hardcore. Mm-hmm. Like literally I'd be like telling the people at the gas pump and at the grocery line. So yep. you know, literally every person I could, you have to know my victim story and how strong I am. Like, yes, oh exactly. Mm-hmm. It was like, no, that was making it worse. It was, was making, making it worse. worse. But then, you know, you don't, people don't get that empathy at home. What happens when you have someone that who's not compassionate or doesn't understand your needs. And then, so you're looking for these strangers. Hey, this is my story. This is my victim's story. You know, feel sorry for me, show me empathy and love because I don't get it here, you know? And then, you know, once they bring it to those groups, they're doing the same thing. It's become a, an addictive pattern and addictive behavior. And then we go back to that addiction, you know, that we're talking about. Yeah. And so with that, it then takes bravery to then break out of the addictive cycle of sharing that victim story. Yes. And that really, I remember the number of times it was like, uh, I would promise myself, I'm not going to go, I'm meeting a new person. They don't have to know about this. Exactly. Exactly. And then I would find myself telling it again over and over. Very common. So common. Yes. And so it's about saying, okay, how many times do I really need to tell this story? Yeah. And when do I want to no longer really identify with this? Yeah. When do I want to, so that's living in the past. Telling the story is living in the past. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes by Dr. Joe Dispenza mm-hmm. is we can either be defined by a story of the past yeah. or a vision of the future. Yes. Mm-hmm. We can either be defined by a story of the past or a vision of the future. And how much more positive and wonderful does it sound? Let's be defined by the vision of the future. You know, you hear that. That's when the energy comes in. That's when the positivity comes in. Wow. What I could make that future into. Wow. You know, and, you know, I find such more positive energy flowing as soon as you said that. And you think of the past, then you're like pulling yourself. I I feel I I see like a black zone, you know, and I feel like that's when you say the word past and you talk about the empathy and the victim and being the victim, it's like, I I see this big black hole and that's what we are pulling ourselves into every time we do that type Mm -hmm. of behavior. Exactly. Yeah. And there's, there's one other thing that I want to touch on as far as the victim story thing Mm -hmm. is the person who is stuck in telling their victim story they've learned that other people see them as strong because of the hardship that they are currently dealing with or have dealt with. Right. And subconscious mind says, hmm, if I no longer have this challenge, people won't see me as strong anymore. Yeah. People won't see me as resilient anymore. Right. How, and then they have, that individual has come to have, get their sense of value in the world by telling their victim story in just the right way to maybe inspire other people. Yeah. And then they say, if I don't have this challenge, how will I be of any value? And so the subconscious mind says, the only way I've learned to be of any value in the world is when I share my victim story. Right. So it's teaching the subconscious mind. You have so many gifts and talents that you may or may not have tapped into. And you are so capable of so much above and beyond that you cannot even recognize or see right now. And trust me, yeah. when you no longer have this challenge, your ability to give back in the world is going to be like a thousand times what it is when you are struggling so deeply with this addiction. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I bet you those people also fear who am I? You know, if I take that victim, victim story and I have to live in the future, well, I don't have, that's all I have, you know? So then who am I? And then the scarcity of, you know, I'm no one. And that goes back to the low self-esteem that you were talking about. 
building that that self-esteem and then focusing on that future that you're talking about, you know, and as soon as you build up, you live in the now and you're building that future, you're building that self-esteem, it seems like, you know, from what you're saying. Yes. And then exactly. you're building that new person, you know? Exactly. And there's one word that comes to mind that is so important when you're saying all this and it's identity. Identity, yes. And the story we tell ourselves and other people is shaping our identity. Right. It is not set in stone. Our identity can shift. It is malleable. And so much of this yeah. has to do with your identity and a shift in identity. Yeah. And I have something that I created called the three Ds, the three big Ds in yeah, part yeah. Of recovery. <laughs> <laughs> but really, it can be used for any addiction, any right. trauma, any bad habit. And so it's essentially detect, define, download. And this is how we change our identity. Part of it is around changing our story. Right. That we tell ourselves and yeah. how how we are defining a vision of our future. Yeah. And so, uh, do you want me to break down the three Ds? Go ahead. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So um, detect, define, download. The first one is detect. You are going to be a detective of your own life, of your subconscious patterns, of all parts of who you are that make up your current identity. Right. And this is going, it's patterns, it's emotional patterns. When, some, when something is triggering to us. Yeah. Whether it's a triggered into laughter or triggered into anger or crying, yeah. escapism, right? Right. Uh, about 95% of who we are by the time we're 25 years old is a set of subconscious programmed uh, set of behaviors and patterns. Yeah. And so it's thought patterns. Are we getting triggered into those self-sabotaging thought patterns? Yeah. That create that internal war zone, that stress response. Yeah. We get stuck on that loop. Is right. it, you know, behavioral patterns? Is right. it uh, emotional patterns where we have an inappropriate emotional response to right. what's happening yeah. in the present moment. And so um, it's going and taking a deep dive and detecting. And I teach my clients, it's a really incredible deep dive into self-awareness, Yeah, a really deep dive. And we identify all of these different patterns that show up in a way that is limiting we call yeah. limiting beliefs, limiting patterns, limiting choices, limiting decisions. It's a limiting emotional response, right? Right. And it's those, every single one of those showed up as a result of some stressor in the past that caused an emotional wound in the subconscious mind that we have not yet healed from. And it right. shows up in unhealthy patterns that don't serve us, that limit us. So the first step is identifying what these are. And we do it on a really deep level. Yeah. You go deep and you get to know yourself more than you ever have. Right. And it is incredible. And so it's identifying the things that are limiting. That's the first D and detect. Right. And it's a lot of these things have been, you know, hidden in the shadows because yeah. we don't want to look at them. We've right. been using lots of escapism behaviors or choices to avoid what those things are because they're a lot of times very unpleasant. Yes. It's not fun to learn about. Right. And, you know, some people call this doing shadow work, for example. Right. It's, it's been hidden in the shadows <laughs> from you. And also it's almost feels like you want to keep them in the shadow from other people because it doesn't feel like a proud thing to, to talk to other people about. Right. It's, it's a brave thing to talk to other people about. Yeah. A very brave thing because it feels vulnerable. And when we're vulnerable, we can either uh, kind of cower and hide or we can brave into it. Yeah. And deal with it and share it and talk about it and explore it and, and feel it. Yeah. So that's, the, well, I kind of <laughs> got a little on a little tangent there with detect. No. Um, so it's detecting all these parts of who you are. And step two is define define what you would rather have each pattern be instead all of the mm -hmm. limiting patterns you get to define and choose for yourself what you would rather have them be right and so they're they can be little ones like 
oh, I noticed that I walk to the fridge five times a day and open it up mindless. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to, that's like an escapism behavior when I'm feeling something uncomfortable or yeah. relapse into, you know, pornography or an addiction that anyone might have. Right. And it could be larger patterns of saying, oh, I noticed that I get in really, uh, you know, like a relationships with someone who's not emotionally available or who, whatever it might be, it could, yeah. so that could be a pattern that lasts for years versus a pattern that shows up 10 times a day. Right. And so it's patterns on all these different levels. So you define what you would rather have them be and we convert them over. This is my limiting pattern. This is what I choose to convert it into as my self-empowering pattern. Yeah. And then it's saying, hmm, what shift needs to take place in my neurology? What emotional wound healing needs to take place in order for that shift to take place, that conversion from the limiting to the self-empowering? Yes. Say Just because we define how we want to show up and who we want to be doesn't mean we automatically begin showing up that way. Right. It's almost never the case, yes. right? It's, it's a, our sub, we're met with a lot of resistance from our subconscious mind. Yeah. Our conscious rational mind said, this is who I want to be. This is the habit I want. This is how I want to show up. This is how I want to interact with, you know, my kids or my family or whatever it might be. Yeah. And so that brings us to the third D, which is download. We have to download it into the subconscious mind. Yeah. Using subconscious strategies. And that's where a bulk majority of my course, which is almost 50 hours of original content in there. And I teach my wow. clients um, the three Ds essentially. Yeah. So we focus a lot on subconscious strategies and detect, define, download. It can work for anyone from, you know, any addiction to heal from any trauma. This is how I personally healed from all the stuff I had going on. Right. I didn't call it the three D's at the time. It yeah. was the process that I had been doing for years. And then I got more organized with how to um, speak about it and, yeah. and, and um, categorize it, which is, which then helps to communicate the process. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Now, where can people find your, your course? Yeah. So it's at selfcraftedking.com, selfcraftedking.com. And as of right now, you know, I'm probably one of the few people who is not really very active on social media. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I like, I'm really proud of that right now. In the yeah. future, things may change just so I can get the word out about Leap of Courage. That's the name right. of the program, Leap of Courage Recovery Program. Yeah. Uh, literally on my front page, it says, don't follow us on social media. Everything you need is right here. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. It feels really good to, because everyone out there is like, follow us on social media. Follow me, follow me, follow me. I'm like, don't follow me on social media. Yeah. <laughs> And it actually says us, even though I'm the one who created this. Right. When I was typing that out, I didn't want to say, don't follow me on social media. Using the word us felt so much better and real. Yeah. True to what it is because it's a community. It's a yes. tribe. Yes. And I, my clients have access to what I call the Kings of Courage community where they can, you know, post and comment. And we have all different categories. Like yeah. Laughter is medicine, post something funny, post about a temporary setback. Yeah. I call that instead of relapse. Right. And, uh, you know, anything self-compassion related, self-forgiveness, like all these different categories you can post on and see what the other men in the, the tribe are, yeah. are saying and you can talk to, the, to each other in there. So. Oh, that's amazing. I love this. I love this so much. Now, besides the, the the course you have, is there anything on your other website that you offer that you want to stress to other people? Yeah, I have some free things on there. Um, I have a webinar right now called uh, The Five Shifts to Overcome Pornography Addiction, but really it's to overcome any addiction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it's that that's on there. I'm currently putting together another webinar. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, so there's gonna be a second one on there, and then anyone can have free access to the introduction of my course. There's several hours of free video content in there, a few self assessments you can submit, things like that. And for anyone who wants to hop on a, as of right now, they're free. 
um, essentially like an hour long Zoom call with one of my coaches. And it's mandatory to actually do an hour of the course for free first. Right. Before you would hop on a call to see if you're a good fit for my program. Oh, um, wow. I like that. I like that. So they're not just jumping into it. They're really getting a feel of who you are, what you do, what the course is about, what they're going to be getting. And then they get to know you and make that connection as well. So that's really important. Not many people do that. I like that a lot. Yeah. You know, the reason why I did that is because in the past, mm -hmm. there were all of these men hopping on. They're like, oh, I can just hop on a free call with someone who's kind and compassionate and understands <laughs> that. But then they would have zero commitment to themselves to make any real change. Yeah. And that's not what we're here for. Right. My team and I, we are here to support the men who've already raised their hands and say, I am fully committed to myself to overcome this. And let's make it happen. Yeah. So when someone is going through all of my material, it's simply because they're seeing who they trust enough to help them with this most important recovery journey that yeah. they, they have and that they want. And I want them to get a sense of who I am and how I operate, how my program operates. And just for, to, to build that trust and rapport and connection. Wow. I love this. I love this. And I'm so excited because we were just talking previously and you're going to be joining our podcast community. And I'm very excited because Jessica is going to have her own podcast on our, on our uh, podcast community. And she's going to be teaching everybody all the different aspects of porn addiction and sex, sex addiction and how to overcome it. And she's going to be really stressing how to get through it and teaching you a lot of valuable things. And she's also going to be going over probably about relapse and what to do if you hit relapse, because that's very common in the addiction community is it that we, you know, we try and sometimes it doesn't always go the way we, we're hoping and we relapse, but that just because you relapse doesn't mean it's the end of the world. You can, you know, you can get back on track and, you know, you, you just keep moving towards recovery until you get to that place where you're strong enough to stay on that pathway. So I'm really excited about this. I'm very excited about this. And, you know, before we go, just tell everybody again, your website. So they have it in their heads. We're going to put it in the description and we'll put it in the information about your course and everything in the description box, but tell everybody one more time. So they have it in their head about the, um, about your website address. Yeah. Self-crafted King picture a crown selfcraftedking.com. And it's self-crafted because you and only you, not me, uh, each individual who goes through my program gets to define for themselves exactly who they want to be, self-crafted king. And the reason why I use the word king is because it's for two reasons. A king gets to choose how they live their own life. Yeah. They are no longer being ruled and dictated by the addiction. Right. They are in control and have autonomy of their life and their decisions. Yes. And the other reason is because the role of a king is to be of service to others. Right. And every human being, no matter who we are, when we are at our best, we are naturally and innately compelled to want to be of service to others. Yes. It feels really good. It is actually healing to us. It yeah. is neurochemically setting us up for happiness. Oh, a hundred percent. And so a part of the recovery journey is tapping into being of service to others, maybe stepping into something that you never thought of before, uh, finding your purpose or defining your purpose mm -hmm. and not having it be all about yourself and just having that natural innate wanting to be of service to others. It just naturally comes out yeah. on this healing journey and it's incredible. 
I'm so I'm I I just love this program. I love how you set it up. I love your way of thinking. It's just amazing. Now, before we go, I, is there any like couple of things that you want to stress, like any tips or anything or anything that you'd like to any takeaways, maybe like a couple of takeaways that you just want the audience to hear before you go? Is there anything that comes to mind that you'd like to share? For anyone who is listening right now and is addicted to something, anything. Just know that you have what it takes to heal and overcome this fully, wholly, and completely. And self-doubt is one of the hurdles to overcome. Yes. When someone hasn't said yes to the healing journey, it's usually because there's so much self-doubt. They don't believe it's possible for them. And that feels so scary. Mm -hmm. And the only time that we ever say yes to something is when we believe it's possible. Yes. If we don't believe in even the possibility, then your subconscious mind will not allow you to say yes to right. whatever the thing is. Mm -hmm. And just know it is possible. Yes. It is possible. And one of the biggest lies that people have heard before is that once an addict, always an, an addict. That is not true at all. No. That is so not true. That is so not true. You can heal fully, wholly, and completely on that deep level to the depths of your soul. <laughs> yes. So true. So yeah. true. Oh my God. This has been amazing, Jessica. And I'm so excited because we're going to see a lot more of you soon to come. And, you know, this is something that needs to be shared with, with, you know, the millions of listeners that listen to us and, and, and for more people out there who need help and you have a friend, you know, word of mouth, share them, you know, and tell them to come listen to our podcast with Jessica, uh, because this is a topic that a lot of people it's, it's, you know, it's a taboo topic. It's, it's something that is, is, is out there. It's prevalent in our society, but it's not talking talked about and we really need to really dive in and it's okay to to have addictions it's okay you know to go through these traumas we, nobody in this world is perfect you know we all have something but if you realize that there is a problem it now is the time to reach out and find the help you need to recover and what's great about Jessica is that her her information her courses her help is all online so take a moment to look in the description box, get her information and contact her because that's the first step of recovery is reaching out and it's okay. Don't, you know, she's been through it. I've been through things similar. We've all been through problems and we've all been, you know, either tap, you know, tap with addiction or trauma in our life and you, everybody can overcome. We all could rise above the chaos and reach our potential in life. It's just reaching out and asking for the right help. And so check out Jessica's website and she'll be talking to you guys soon. So everybody have a great day. And thank you so much, Jessica, for everything that you shared today. It's been a blessing to have you here. It's been a total blessing. Thank you. It has been an absolute honor. And thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for being on the show. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.